The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Ontario is an enormous province with people spread across more than a million square kilometers. And while we're all currently under a stay at home order, that can feel different depending on where home is. So tonight we're leaving the big city behind virtually to go and find out how folks in smaller and rural communities are experiencing these strange times. First, as part of our collaboration with Roma, that's the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, as they wrap up their annual conference, Nam Kiwanuka talks to Peterborough Kawartha MP and Cabinet Minister Mariam Monsef about the federal government's promises on rural economic development and COVID-19 relief. It's Tuesday, January 26th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. This pandemic may be global, but its impacts are felt very much on the local level. The federal government has opened the spending tabs wide and promised to build back better. How well have they addressed the specific challenges facing rural Ontario, including those issues for which money alone isn't enough? With us now on that, Maryam Monsef. She is the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. She is the Liberal MP for Peterborough Kawartha, which is where we find her today as part of our collaboration with the Rural Ontario Municipal Association during their 2021 annual conference. Hello, Minister. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, before we got uh, uh, started taping, I was just sharing with you that I'm also a refugee and I also learned how to speak English in part by watching TVO. So it's very nice to have you here today. Likewise, it's quite a privilege to, to be at this seat in this particular moment in Canada's history. Um, you know, um, a lot has happened in the past year. Obviously, the world has been turned upside down because of the COVID uh, pandemic. How do the challenges that rural Ontario um, was facing 10 months ago compare to the ones that they're facing now? Well, to everybody who's on the front lines of COVID, from municipal leaders to uh, first responders to essential workers, we thank you. You're holding it all together for us, and we draw inspiration from you. Most urgent issue in rural communities right now has been broadband. If you are in a community, in a household without internet access, well, you needed that access yesterday. And the isolation that comes with lockdown, that comes with reducing travel and activity, especially over the holidays, has been particularly hard felt for those Canadians who are living in rural communities like my own. Um, you know, a year ago, not many of us had heard of Zoom. Um, uh, children are uh, learning at home. Teachers are learning how to navigate the online platforms. As you mentioned, in rural communities, there is that additional challenge because of a lack of broadband. Um, what is the government, uh, the federal government, doing to address this urgent issue? Well, we started back in 2015. So there are 1.7 million households who are on their way to getting connected to high-speed internet because of the work we began in 2015. And these are complex projects that take time. They go through a series of environmental assessments and indigenous consultations and engineering and so on and so forth. But back in November, we decided to double down on our plans and we put forward additional funds to connect every Canadian to high-speed internet much more quickly. And on Friday, our application process for the rapid response broadband fund closed. We've received hundreds of applications, quality applications, and my team and I are quickly going through them so that we can let proponents know that they've been approved so that they can begin the work and get shovels in the ground this construction season. 
As you mentioned, this is a very complex issue, but I think if you do live in a rural community, maybe that's not something that, you know, um, when you talk about how much time it's going to take, it's um, it makes people uh, anxious. It's affecting people's livelihoods. Um, and back in August, we discussed the broadband uh, problem on the agenda. And I'd like to play you a short clip of uh, my exchange with University of Guelph professor Hel Helen Hambly, who's been leading Canada's oldest ongoing broadband uh, research effort. Sheldon, please roll. Both the federal and the provincial government have promised uh, better broadband. How well are they doing in bridging that digital divide? Uh, so far, it's uh, slow. At this state, um, we are behind countries uh, in Scandinavia, South Korea, uh, and uh, certainly even behind countries like Chile and Mexico and the Czech Republic in terms of fiber penetration. And that's a real concern as we see the dependency that our economies and our societies have on high-speed internet. Well, what's your response to concerns that the progress on the broadband file is so slow that we're behind countries like Chile and Mexico? I think, Helen, Professor Hamley's uh, remarks back in August are bang on. And we listen to experts like her, municipal leaders across the country. And when we came out in November with the Universal Broadband Fund, it brought Canada on par with our competitors across the country. This is the single largest investment in broadband in Canada's history. It is going to accelerate the pace of connections in communities across the country. The federal government's at the table, and we are committed to ensuring that funding is not the limiting factor for this. And we are working very closely with all partners, including our provincial and territorial partners, who are doing their own work on this to ensure that there's a coordination. One of the complexities of broadband projects in Canada this big, beautiful, diverse country of ours is that there are a lot of cooks in this kitchen, and rightfully so. Different communities have different needs. So in addition to investing funds, in addition to accelerating the pace of approvals, the federal government has stepped up, and we're going to be the coordinator across the country to ensure that there is efficiency and we get rid of as much red tape as possible. Because as you said, Canadians who don't have access to broadband right now for health and safety reasons, for their kids' education or their own skills training, for doing online shopping or teleworking. They simply cannot afford to stay behind the rest of us. And I do believe that Canada's recovery from this recession starts in rural Canada and it begins with broadband. Uh, in November, the Prime Minister announced plans to connect 98% of Canadians to high-speed internet by 2026, and a goal of connecting all Canadians by 2030. There are municipal officials in Ontario who've said the federal government's um, 2030 timeline is unacceptable. Uh, one of those officials is uh, Kelly Elliott, the Deputy Mayor of Thames Centre, which is an underserved uh, part of the country when it comes to high-speed internet. Um, here she Here's how she described the issue to us via email. Today, rural children are struggling to access their virtual education. Rural Canadians cannot access resources and programming when it comes to health care, including mental health resources. Municipalities are struggling to market themselves for investments when a business cannot operate without basic internet. In the year 2021, where our lives are dependent on a virtual world, what do you say to rural Canadians who are struggling and are being told, just wait, nine more years, when they have already struggled and waited for so long. What's your message to rural Ontarians who are tired of waiting for broadband? Uh, to Madam Deputy Mayor and to anyone watching this, you have every reason to be frustrated. Life is hard enough as it is. In the best of times, it is incredibly difficult during COVID and even more so without the opportunity to FaceTime your loved ones, without having a glitch-free connection that lets you do your work and stay on top of the news. So you have every right to be frustrated and know that the federal government has heard you. We got your back and we're doing everything we can to get communities connected faster. Now, the 2030 timeline is for the 2% of communities in Canada, the hardest to reach regions, which are probably going to get connected through low Earth orbit satellites. The other 98%, 
we are accepting applications. We will be opening a new round of applications to connect communities. And I want every Canadian watching this to know that the federal government is going to do everything it can with our partners to connect as many Canadians as quickly as possible. It's not just a matter of fairness. It's not just a matter of health and safety. It's a matter of Canada's competitiveness in the post-COVID world, and we are all in this together. Uh, what do you think is needed from industry and other levels of government to tackle the broadband issue at a more rapid pace? We're there. The, 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 the good news is that things are moving, communities are getting connected. At the end of 2020, for example, tens of thousands of households who didn't have connection at the beginning of the year had that high-speed access. So things are happening. Shovels are going into the ground. Uh, you know, our, our essential workers were doing that work even during COVID as safely as possible following those guidelines. In this coming construction season, we're going to see hundreds of projects move forward through the new program. And my my best advice, in fact, my plea to anybody watching this is, we're here to help. There is money on the table, and we're going to do everything we can to support high quality projects to move forward. So please reach out to us, and we will get this done together as quickly as possible. Is there a little bit, I know um, uh, hindsight is 2020, but is there a bit of frustration from the government for? Uh, being in the place that we are today, because I think the pandemic was maybe the final nail to say, hey, uh, we do have a real broadband connectivity issue in Canada. Is there a sense in government that maybe we should have uh, taken this more on head sooner? As I said, we've been working on this file since we formed government, right? 1.7 million households on their way to getting connected or already connected because of the work and the investments that were done in 2015. But I will share a personal frustration with you. Back when we could travel back and forth between Ottawa and Peterborough Kawartha, which is where I'm from, the highway that connects us being the highway, highway, seven, highway 7, along this highway, it is hard not to see the hollowed out smaller communities who are beautiful, rich in resources, rich in their natural heritage. It is hard to drive by those smaller communities who never recovered, who never fully recovered after the 2008 recession. Investments in connectivity back then, investments in cell service back then would have been completed and would have allowed that connection and connectivity to communities along that route today. But you know what? We are determined to learn from the mistakes of the past. We will not be repeating them. And as I said, the vision here is that recovery begins in rural Canada and it begins with broadband access. You're also a minister for women and gender equality um, and the lack of connectivity um, along vast stretches of highway uh, also becomes a safety issue. One of the populations at risk for violence in these areas include Indigenous women. Um, what progress has been made with implementing the calls for justice from the final report of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls? To think that there are long stretches of roads and highways, as you said, all across this country, those highways of tears, where our daughters find themselves in really horrible situations and they can't even call for help is unthinkable. Part of the Universal Broadband Fund includes funds set aside specifically to address those very long stretches of the roads where tragedies like missing murdered Indigenous women and girls happen far too often. Uh, Minister Bennett and I met with all the ministers in Canada responsible for the status of women, as well as Indigenous leaders and representatives a few days ago. And the purpose of this meeting was to get an update on how COVID is affecting Indigenous women and girls, but also to track our progress on the response to the calls for justice, the 231. At this point, we are moving closely with our partners forward. We are working to ensure that women are safe, that their families are cared for, and that they are working. And at a time when COVID has hit women hardest, 
particularly Black, Indigenous, and racialized women hardest. We are all renewing our resolve to do better so that those women can not only be in safer situations, but that they can contribute to Canada's recovery to their fullest abilities. Uh, women living in rural areas are also overrepresented when it comes to domestic violence. Uh, and during the COVID pandemic, we've been hearing a lot about the shadow pandemic. Um, studies suggest that the issue of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, has increased uh, since March. Federal consultations from your own government showed um, 20 to 30 percent increase. And you yourself noted that in some places, the calls for help have gone gone up some 400 percent, which is astounding. Um, your party, which has prided itself in being a feminist government, has been criticized for not doing enough to address domestic violence uh, during this pandemic. How do you respond to that? To anybody who's in an abusive home, who is unsure as to whether there are resources and supports out there, I want you to know that there are thousands of organizations across this country in smaller communities and in urban centers whose doors are open to you, who are working hard to get the cleaning supplies and the PPE so that for you and your loved ones, there is safety and care available. So if you're experiencing violence, talk to someone you trust and reach out to one of these organizations. We've supported some 1,500 organizations across the country to keep their doors open, to keep their staff paid, and to ensure that they are safe and available for women and children in their hour of need. So do you reject this, the criticism that your government hasn't done enough? I can assure anybody watching this that we're doing everything we can to eradicate gender-based violence. And if I may, Canada has recently been acknowledged by Care International as having the single best analysis of how COVID affects women and diverse communities. And that's something that we take with some humility, knowing that we're on the right track. We are doing more. We are investing fivefold in frontline women's organizations compared to how things were before we formed government. There is an additional $50 million in uh, circulation right now, directly providing that to frontline organizations into their bank accounts so they don't have to go through a lengthy application process. There will be additional funds coming, some $100 million this quarter to support organizations with the response to COVID and recovery. And I know that until every single case of domestic violence and gender-based violence ends, our work is not complete. But I also know that our government has invested more in women's organizations and in intersectional feminism theory, practice, and programming than any other government in Canada's history. And we continue to build on that success because, as I said, Canada's recovery depends on it, and our sisters and our daughters and our kids are counting on us. Uh, we're hearing a lot of um, anecdotal stories of how women have been um, disproportionately been impacted during this pandemic, uh, many of them putting their lives and their families' lives at risk while working low-paying jobs on the front lines. What is your message to them? I would say that the statistics support those anecdotes, that those women on the front lines of the response to COVID, the women fighting this, or well, the sectors fighting this are over 90% women, and they are often racialized women, black women who are taking on these essential care responsibilities for the rest of us. So to those of you who work in long-term care homes, who get up every day and go back into those risky situations, even after an outbreak has been called, and you look after our elders with the respect and with the carefulness that you do, we thank you. To those who are, you know, looking after our grocery stores, to those who are answering calls of women and trans folks in distress, experiencing the violence and abuse, we thank you. Know that the government of Canada has your back and know that there is a nation and a reckoning happening where we appreciate the true value of this essential care work that has for so long held our economies together and we're just beginning to understand truly the value of that work now. We will not forget you and provinces, territories, the federal government are working together to support you in every way we can.
Uh, late last year, Royal Bank released a study that showed uh, the percentage of women leaving the workforce during this COVID pandemic. Um, and when women do hopefully return to work in the same numbers uh, in the aftertimes, childcare is going to be of paramount importance. Uh, you mentioned the childcare. Um, what is the timeline for a national childcare strategy? Well, that work is happening right now. You heard in the fall economic statement, in, in the fall, obviously, uh, the finance minister put forward an ambitious plan uh, that also included a strong commitment to universal early learning and child care. She, she made it very clear that she was going to, you know, nose to the grindstone on this one. And as a working mom, she takes this very seriously as does the prime minister. So that work is ongoing and the government of Canada is working on a women in the economy action plan, which in addition to the work already underway includes convening really smart economists and feminists who can help guide the way, setting up the secretariat for early learning and childcare, hearing from early learning and child care workers themselves, like the ones here in Peterborough, who are telling me that for the first time in a really long time, they are hopeful about Canada having a system, a system in place that is universal, that is quality and affordable, and they want to be part of those conversations. So all of this work is happening, of course, in parallel to the track that is responding to COVID and rolling out the vaccine and to all the women on the front lines of that work inside governments, in clinics, in communities across the country. We thank you. History is going to remember you well. And we look forward to the day when you don't have as much as you do on your plate. Um, so you don't have a timeline, though? Because I think a lot of people are interested in knowing when that would happen. The work of designing an early learning uh, child care system that is universal takes a little bit of time. But as the prime minister and the finance minister said, we're willing to work with any province and territory who's ready to go on this. So those conversations are happening. And the best timeline I can provide you is as soon as possible. Of course, funds have already flown. Some 40,000 spaces that didn't exist before reform government have already been created. And we are looking to accelerate that work. There is a budget coming. Our province, provincial colleagues are doing the same. Uh, that work is happening, and we are determined to get it right. The Quebec model, of course, provides us all with a really good North Star, mm -hmm. something that has shown to work, that has shown uh, to get women back into the workforce. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch. We're building on success that has already existed and models that are right in front of us. Um, we have about 30 seconds left, but uh, we've been hearing a lot of uh, uh, stories of people leaving, uh, say, Toronto, for example, and moving um, up north. Um, but some people are deterred from leaving the urban core because, again, lack of internet uh, broadband. Uh, what is the future for rural Canada? The future for rural Canada is bright. As you said, the quality of life that we enjoy here is being sought by many. The quality of life is about to improve with universal broadband access as it rolls out across the country. Rural communities have a tendency to care for each other and there's a great level of interdependence. We've supported digital main streets and more small businesses are online. And we are also supporting rural communities with their housing needs and with other infrastructure needs. So the future is bright. Our challenge as rural communities and rural leaders is to ensure that that growth that is inevitably happening is manageable and sustainable and the government of Canada is at the table to provide any support to that end. Uh, Minister Monsef, that is our time. We really appreciate your insights and taking uh, time out of your busy schedule during this pandemic to speak to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've all heard a lot about how COVID-19 prompted lockdowns and disruption in hotspots in the province, especially in the greater Toronto area. But the pandemic most certainly has not passed smaller and rural communities by, as the current state of emergency makes clear. With us to get a sense of just what this crisis has felt like in their areas, can we welcome, from furthest away to closest to our studio, as is our custom, 
On Manitoulin Island, not far from Little Current, there's Al McNevin. He's the mayor of the town of northeastern Manitoulin and the islands. In Greater Napanee, just west of Kingston, Ontario, Mayor Marg Isbester. In Trent Hills, Ontario, just northeast of Belleville, Municipal Councillor Catherine Redden. She's a former three-term mayor of Campbellford and recently retired from the board of the Rural Ontario Institute. And in Collingwood, Ontario, Dr. Jennifer Young. She's a family physician who attends patients in hospital and community practice and is a past president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Great to welcome you four from various parts of our province. And, and I actually don't want to assume that everybody watching this knows where you four are from. So I'm going to start by just having our director, Sheldon Osmond, bring up this map to show that we've really got, I guess, from the French River down, pretty well covered here. Little Current, Manitoulin Island, largest freshwater island in the world, just about two hours southwest of Sudbury. And then coming down at the foot of Georgian Bay, there's Collingwood. And then as we go into the eastern part of the province, Trent Hill and Greater Napanee as we move towards Kingston and eventually Ottawa. So that's where you four are. And Mark, why don't you get us started with this? Rural means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Uh, it not only does it mean different things to different people, Steve, but it also is evolving. So right now I, I see rural in our area as uh, meaning there's there's a great sort of community feel. Uh, nice thing about going through this pandemic is there is support from groups from faith faith based and so on. But that's changing a lot in that people are evolving and moving out to our areas. So therefore, rural is also looking for all the amenities that uh, even the more populated areas have. But it's still got a good feel and just as much fear in our area as there are in the urbans. Hmm. Catherine Redden, how about you? What does rural mean to you? Well, I think, as Margaret said, the definition of rural is, is becoming more blurred. It used to be any er area not urban, but um, we have some great developments now that are, are growing in, in leaps and bounds. But it's still that, that area that's uh, a little less settled, a little less populated, um, still has good services, and it has that great community spirit where you literally know everyone if you're not related to them, you know them or you've seen them on the streets. And um, it's an area that is becoming uh, um, more of, uh, of somewhere that everyone else wants to be just because of the lifestyle. Jennifer Young. Uh, uh, in healthcare, there is a this the definition of rurality that is called the, the Ontario Rurality Index, and what it does is combine a combination of population density and distance from your primary healthcare, as well as distance from healthcare that would be more secondary, so so more advanced uh, referral services. And to me, it also in in Bobadies, because of that uh, relative lack of density, there's also a less density of of healthcare professionals, and and each healthcare professional in the rural area tends to need to be a generalist. So family doctors, in particular, play so many different roles because of that less uh, less density of specialists. They are in the eMERGE, in the hospital, doing OB, long term care, leadership, and many other of our colleagues nurses and um, play those more generalist roles the more rural you get. Understood. Al McNevin. Well, I'd have to agree with a lot of the comments from the other uh, participants, but uh, uh, it's for us, it's a, a caring uh, community that uh, has a smattering of agriculture and settlements, villages uh, and towns. Uh, and probably the, the biggest definition for me is that if you try and find out where you want to go and instead of giving you a street address and uh, uh, a house number, they'll tell you to drive up until you get before the bridge a mile and then turn left <laughs> at the old barn and then you'll find somebody you're looking for. So that's about it. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. I know. Um, okay, uh, Mayor McNevin, let me keep it with you because uh, obviously all of you have heard about what COVID-19 has done to some of the much more populated areas of this province, but I want to give people a better sense about what COVID-19 has meant to much smaller places. Now, yours is an island of, I don't know what, 5,000 permanent residents or something like that. Uh, ha has COVID-19 been much of a factor at all over the past year? Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, like like the rest of, uh, I guess, the world and communities across Ontario, uh, uh, people are, uh, are are struggling. They're fearful of uh, what this means, and 
there's a lot of uh, mental health uh, issues for people that are particularly living in vulnerable situations. So um, uh, I guess we've, we, we've had to adapt and learn, but uh, one of the biggest things that's happened is uh, on the island itself, we have uh, nine municipalities and uh, seven First Nations, uh, and, and uh, we often uh, didn't have a real sense of what the impact of uh, uh, the East community's uh, reaction to the pandemic has been. So we've, uh, we've, we've formed a collaborative group where we meet with uh, all those parties on a weekly basis, and uh, we try and give a, an update on what's happening to each other. And uh, we, we've really learned a lot about the island, even though we've been here for many years, most of us. So it's been, uh, I think, a good thing. It's helped us to come together in a lot of ways. Okay. Mayor Isbester, what's the COVID-19 situation been like over the past year in your neck of the woods? Well, it certainly had a great effect on our small business community, which uh, we do have a combination of rural and urban, but a very vibrant downtown, sort of mom and pop sort of stores, but we also have in our outer limits, uh, the big box stores. And it's been very, very tough on our small ones to see the, um, the large ones be able to stay open. And, and it's just a constant you know, when and how and is it safe? Uh, I think, too, um, for any small community, and I'm sure that the other mayors will, will certainly agree with me, is our people don't sit and listen to any of the politicians at noon on news. They reach out. We get the phone calls. When does this end? Where can I go? Can I go for a walk? So so it's it's good for that. But a, a good thing that's come out of, out of it is the collaboration between our health services, uh, the municipality and the people, the faith-based, uh, getting uh, food and so on out. So there has been a great collaboration. We just seem to be able to snap our fingers and everybody's there to help, of course, socially distance, physically distance, and they have their masks on. But but that has been a good thing. Our small businesses are suffering the most, and that has to end. Councillor Redden, how about in your part of the province? Well, similar to Mark's, we've uh, got uh, three small communities, Campbellford being the largest. So it's had a great impact on our downtown, uh, initially with the closing of all of our stores and our services. But um, we had a great volunteer effort come together to help serve those that were in their homes without family support. Um, everyone has done their best. Um, everyone's wearing masks. We're distancing. We're doing everything we should. But um, it's, it's either um, there's no real in between. Either the businesses are able to service and uh, do curbside and provide uh, um, everything that, that that individuals are looking for, or they're having to close down, go home, and um, fear that they won't be op able to open again. It's uh, it's uh, a, a tough time for a small community, and um, we're doing our best. All right, Dr. Young, what is your biggest public health concern in your neck of the woods? So, Al, uh, Collingwood is not quite as rural as many of the communities that would call themselves mm -hmm. rural in Canada. And, and I would really speak to the, the, the immense uh, health care workers in rural communities are paper thin and very fragile. And so taking one of those out of a community can have a very large impact on their ability to offer care. For example, some communities might have just two x-ray techs. And so if one gets sick, then that one x-ray tech is on 24 seven for their community all the time. If you have a physician who is one of five physicians in a community that looks after all those roles and is sick, and not able to work for a couple of weeks, then then the the, the burden is super high. A metrics nurse who is out could close down the obstetric services of a community. So the 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 need to protect communities that are so fragile from the infection is really is really acute. And I I, I uh, so that's yeah. So I would say that the next wave of our of our priorities would be to make sure that even though there isn't high prevalence in many of these communities, uh, the the fragility of that community's healthcare sector is so high that vaccination for that those the healthcare communities for those healthcare workers is really a, a very very high priority to protect those communities and the healthcare workers within it let me ask mayor mcnevin a follow-up on that anybody got the vaccine yet on the island 
Yes, uh, uh, just uh, about a, a week ago, the uh, long-term care facility on the Wick Wimicon uh, First Nation uh, received uh, the vaccinations from uh, Moderna, uh, Moderna, and uh, uh, we've uh, been advised uh, just uh, ye yesterday that uh, the uh, other two long-term care homes on the island will be receiving theirs by February 5th, so it's good news. Uh, uh, they're very uh, in a situation where obviously the spread of the pandemic has been uh, a huge impact on long-term care homes. So uh, I, we're looking forward to that getting done, and then uh, hopefully we'll see the rest of the phase uh, one and two roll out soon. Mm. Uh, Your Worship, let me follow up again with this. Uh, I was on the island last summer and um, went to a flea market in a town of 100 people, Kagawang. And I was surprised when I went there that there was such adherence to the protocols. Even outdoors on a lovely summer afternoon, everybody had masks on. They were taking people's names and phone numbers as you walked into the flea market in case they had to follow up with contact tracing afterwards. Um, you know, there was no monkey business. And we're talking about a place where, you know, there's maybe been a handful of cases of COVID since this whole thing began. Are you surprised at the amount of adherence to protocols you've seen? Well, I, I guess I am. It, it seems, I guess it's been almost a year, and uh, uh, people that uh, live on Manitoulin, uh, uh, I would have to say the majority have really been cautious. They've been uh, uh, really good at trying to follow the guidelines from uh, public health. And when we get contacted by a lot of our citizens, um, they have questions, and we try and, and steer them that way so that they understand it. But uh, uh, it's interesting about a rural area like Manitoulin Island is uh, I'm often surprised when we're all wearing masks that we still can figure out who each other is. It's a miracle, I think. <laughs> well, as was indicated earlier, everybody knows everybody. Mark Isbester, yeah. how about to you? Uh, your chief public health concerns at the moment are what? Um, certainly uh, the vaccine, uh, getting it, uh, which is ha it has been uh, put into our long-term care homes, uh, not so much in my part of KFLNA, which is the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington, but I think actually they start today. A and, and just um, making sure that, that uh, we're ready for, God forbid, um, a, a, thir a third wave. Uh, we, we have to get past this. And, and, and the same as, as my other uh, components on here is, is small municipalities. Certainly, I think that they, they keep the rules. Uh, they stay by them because they're so visible to everybody. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody is ready to not so much rat people out, but to even say to them, come on, we've got to get through this together. Probably ratting out is part of it as well, but but uh, <laughs> I, I think I think that certainly uh, cer certainly there is uh, there is a respect for it, and because we support our hospital so much financially as people, not as a government, but as people, that we know the stress that we're putting on, and we know how fortunate. And I'm going to touch every piece of wood that's available to me. That we have not had this monster creep in under the doors of our long-term care. And when I look at what other municipalities are going through, my heart just goes out to them. Hmm. Catherine Redden, how much has COVID affected your community so far? Well, in terms of cases, they've been very few. Um, and we've been very fortunate as well not to have um, tremendous outbreaks in our in our nursing homes and our long-term care long-term uh, care homes. Um, an outbreak around here is is one individual positive. Um, so we've been very, very careful with visiting, with protocols and so on. And our hospital sits right in the center of our community. And as Mark says, uh, rural communities support um, their hospitals and their healthcare providers. We've actually had parades. We had a tractor parade earlier in the year with our agricultural community just to lift the spirits of our, of our nurses and doctors and the other providers in the hospital to show them how much we care. We've lit our town with lights. Uh, our Christmas lights in many cases still still exist. Uh, signage on the, on the lawns and uh, deliveries of some of the best donuts you could find up to the individuals in the emergency to, to keep them going. It's been a long time for them and very few of us uh, don't know someone working at the hospital or in some of the other clinics. So um, we were really heartened this week to learn that some adults 
doses of vaccine are now available in our area and we just hope we can hurry that up and uh, and take care of our, our most vulnerable first. Let me follow that hasp hospital angle with Mayor Al and that is yeah. I think there's two hospitals on Manitoulin Island and I'm betting that they might I don't know one or two ICU beds in each hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. How are they managing so far? Well, it's interesting throughout this uh, pandemic, like we've we found out a lot more about healthcare than we ever knew before. Uh, uh, so working together with the uh, management team at the hospital, uh, we, we, it was identified very early that they have perhaps the capability of uh, two ICU beds in uh, each hospital and uh, would be very quickly overrun uh, if we had an outbreak of any kind on Manitoulin. So in uh, the very beginning, after the first wave struck, we uh, we found a way to uh, work with the Manitoulin Health Centre to create a field hospital uh, with a 30-bed capacity to help in the event that uh, we had a, a, a surge or uh, an outbreak on Manitoulin Island. So uh, the, the hospital worked with the staff in uh, our, our municipality in Little Kirk, but it was a collaborative effort with other communities to create that facility in our recreation center where we have our arena and curling club. And uh, it, it was the only real building on the, the island that had separate uh, heating ventilation systems so that uh, both the patients and the uh, the workers, the healthcare providers would have a safe place to uh, either eat their meals, change into their equipment and, and go into the patient area. So uh, that's been ready since uh, early in the pandemic. Hopefully we'll never have to use it. But as Dr. Young said, there'll be, uh, there's a huge risk uh, with the number of uh, physicians and uh, uh, frontline workers at the hospital that they would be quickly overrun. And uh, as a collaborative effort, we've been able to combine all the healthcare workers uh, across the island to uh, step up to that field hospital should we need it uh, in the event of another uh, surge. So. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Young, I actually want to ask you a non-medical question, although uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure medicine and healthcare come into this in a big way. Uh, broadband has been raised as a huge issue all over rural Ontario. How do you, in your work and in your contacts with, with people in your area of the province, how, how is that an issue for you? Now that so much care is being offered virtually and so much of our lives are being led virtually, it's, it to me is a basic Canadian right, access to excellent broadband um, internet, especially in rural areas where those distances are even further. And uh, and so for our healthcare, for example, we will we do video calls and if somebody's not able to connect with us with a good connection, those are uh, it, really hampered phone calls can can do the the majority of our visits but there are some interactions such as sensitive counseling or some we can do physical examinations that are you know not actually hands-on obviously but ones that that are 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 aided by that good internet connection <laughs> rural areas are doing it uh, virtual icu where remote communities can tap into an ICU bed or ICU physicians in, in communities far away. And that video, quality of that video, it, it may, means a whole lot to providing excellent care. And then that also obviously extends to uh, education and business. And in order to, in order to provide equitable access to those, those, uh, these parts of our lives, internet that's excellent needs to be there for all of us. Hmm. I don't want to jinx it because it's been pretty good so far. We haven't had any big dropouts, but Mayor Marg, uh, on a typical daily basis, how's the bandwidth where you are? Well, on a typical day, I'm okay where I am, but uh, certainly we have pockets of our municipality because we are along, uh, along and, and sort of north-south. So there are pockets uh, for, for broadband, which of course we're working on, but we can't work on them nearly enough. And I'm, I'm really pleased and, and a learning process to see how it is with the health system, doctor. I had not thought about that. It's just another way to press our other governments to, to, to get their stuff together. 
together and get this broadband out. Uh, I mm -hmm. thank you for that. I'll yeah. pass that on to my Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. That's uh, that's good information that I probably should have thought of. Sorry to take so long. <laughs> <laughs> now, I bet when you talk to that caucus, you're not going to say, get their stuff together. I bet you're going to say something else. I was really hoping that I would get stuff <laughs> out instead of something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Councillor Redden, how about broadband where you are? What's it like? Well, in the urban areas, it's excellent, and uh, um, we're able to do some a lot of our meetings um, and um, a Zoom virtual community organizations are having uh, 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 meetings back and forth. But it's it's the same thing. If you're located outside of town, Northumberland is known for its hills, and if you're on the wrong mm -hmm. side of the hill, you just don't get good reception. Um, I actually was involved with a conservation authority meeting last week, where four of our members had to telephone in. Um, they weren't able to 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 do the Zoom, so it is difficult. Um, and and just the nature of the membership of many of our organizations. We also have individuals who um, are older and are not as technically savvy. And so um, there, there are a lot of concerns that so many meetings and so many events are being held virtually that they're not able to participate. So we have to address that as well. But I should say that the Eastern Ontario um, Regional Network um, or EORN is doing great things in and pushing both the federal and the provincial governments for funding. And uh, smaller municipalities are definitely looking towards them to, um, to get some results. It is becoming as important as a telephone or as electricity to have access to internet. And Mayor McNevin on the yeah. island, how's the bandwidth there? Well, it's a it's a, a mix of uh, situations. If you're definitely if you're outside of the settlement or village areas, it's uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, for our council itself, it's been uh, uh, quite a learning curve. For uh, we, we, a lot of people live in the rural parts. Uh, we've actually been given support to some of our staff and council to uh, help them. Uh, join those meetings or work from home, including helping with the tower, small tower installations so that they can get uh, connected to different uh, internet providers. Uh, but uh, like all uh, rural municipalities, it's a major uh, struggle. And uh, we're, we've been supporting applications by a number of uh, providers to try and get funding through different uh, provincial and federal programs. And we're hoping that as time goes on, we'll see those start to materialize uh, uh, like we've heard from a lot of other communities the it's essential today uh, we, we can't operate anymore with people not being connected and it's uh, been very difficult for the uh, children that are at home uh, often uh, having to work online with uh, two or three uh, children in the family with no bandwidth uh, maybe even not enough computers it's uh, tricky sometimes okay let's spend some time here on something that we hear a lot about in the big cities, but having you four here, you're like a mini focus group where we can actually test whether this is actually happening. Dr. Young, to you first. We are hearing that because of the intensity of COVID-19 in big cities, and of course the price of housing as well, a lot of people have just decided, you know what, enough of the city. I am moving to a less populated part of Ontario, better quality of life, cheaper, uh, far farther away from COVID, are you seeing any signs on the ground that this is actually happening in your neck of the woods? I can't tell you how many signs on the ground I'm seeing of that happening. <laughs> um, first off, many people have winter homes and they have come since the beginning of the pandemic, pandemic have come to work from those second homes. And, uh, and the uh, number of 416 telephone numbers that we have in our emergency room and in our businesses are, is, is, really increased over the last uh, during the pandemic um the housing market has absolutely exploded and housing costs are uh, you, can't, you can't find a house and when you do find one you're i have a friend who's a real estate agent and a realtor and she has had uh, a 22-way uh, bid on one house most recently so the the, the it's it's hugely hugely uh changed this last year i guess people who are in are happy that their home prices and values are going up, but I guess if you're trying to get a place, tougher now? Well, it's hard for people who want to buy their first home to, to now compete with that Toronto market. I would say there's it's, it's tough now. If you want to own a house in Collingwood, you need to 
almost need a two two income household. Hmm. Okay, Catherine Redden, how about in Trent Hills? How is it there? Well, right now, I'm really pleased to say that our construction um, industry is it's booming, booming. We've got at least uh, two, possibly three housing developments underway, um, geared more to uh, a retirement um, age. But we've got some condos, um, single family homes. Um, and in the last year, probably 12 to 15 homes already up and built in Campbellford. And in the outlying areas, we're seeing individuals move moving in from the city, deciding to drive in and out of the out of uh, Toronto or Ajax and have their family um, enjoy a, a, a slower pace of life. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of cottage conversions or additions put onto them rather than three season, they're going to four season and they're choosing to work from here. And um, that just um, harkens to um, our issues around, around the internet and access for them to stay. And tremendous number of home-based businesses where they're building garages and additions they can work from. So it's it's booming. And Mayor Marg in Napanee? Oh, it, the same thing, of course. We're right on 401 and uh, uh, certainly between uh, two large centres that are military centres within uh, Trenton, uh, CFB Trenton and CFB Kingston. So so you are bringing a lot of people into the area that, that do want to stay here for a lot of reasons, just as, as Catherine has said, which has put a lot of pressure on supplies, put a lot of pressure on our trades, uh, good pressure, uh, and a lot of pressure on our development services uh, for our, uh, our municipality, trying to make sure mm -hmm. that we get things done. Uh, I would think that the same maybe as Trent Hills, we are seeing more of a, a of a senior population that's coming here. And the amenities that they want are things that we're going to have to start being able to, uh, to supply. You know, things are going to have to change. They want to come here because of the safety but they will be a demanding population for the amenities that they're going to require as well. Hmm. Now, Mayor Al, I wouldn't think, given that you're anywhere from a six to an eight hour drive from the 416, I wouldn't think you were much of an option for people who wanted to get away from the city, are you? <laughs> well, it's surprising. I, I think I'll share what we've already heard from our other uh, participants, but the, uh, um, I'll give you an example. Like there's a uh, one chap that I met that uh, moved to the island uh, that was capable of working from home and renovated uh, his uh, cottage into a, a year-round residence. And he worked for a company that had an office in uh, Liberty Village in Toronto with 400 employees. And since the uh, pandemic has started, everyone's been uh, working from home and the, they're in a business that they can ha work in a digital environment. So. Um, uh, it turns out that not only are they moving from Toronto to Manitoulin Island and to Collingwood and other places, but uh, now that they can uh, prove that they can reliably do their jobs, some of them are moving back to where they grew up, whether it's in the East Coast or the West Coast, and then they have their <laughs> weekly meetings or daily meetings. Uh, they're all over the country now, and I, I think that the last uh, year has been a record year for us uh, on Manitoulin in terms of building permits and construction and renovation. You can't buy a stick of lumber on the weekend anymore here without uh, lining up for it. You know, it's very busy and uh, it will put pressure on uh, the services we provide. They will demand uh, better services than we currently have. And, and in terms of health care, it's uh, obviously a big factor because uh, we're, we're, you know, we ramp up in the summers for visiting population when we have locum doctors, et cetera. But uh, to start providing it year round, we're going to have to look at solutions that uh, give us better. Hmm. Councillor sure. Councillor Redden, how about the notion of Ontarians who couldn't cross the border and go to the United States as they might have done at some point in the past year? Have you noticed more in-province tourism in your part of the province? Oh, absolutely. I think there's a new term coming out called um, over tourism. And um, as much as we had it on our wish list to um, have everybody know where Trent Hills was and all the amenities within it, we had so many individuals come this year that we literally couldn't handle them and had to uh, had to shut down a number of our parks, actually, and restrict access to others. Um, it was very difficult. We, we love having people come and see what we have here 
year. But on the other hand, there's a lot of work that we have to do to upgrade the amenities, uh, washrooms, um, facilities for food, um, and just having individuals that go in and look after the parks um, after hours. Um, however, um, the good thing is now they uh, the cottages were um, fully booked, the campgrounds were booked, and we have people that um, did a lot of staycations here. And so our um, our locations were were um, busy, and um, in some cases overwhelmed. So uh, that's on our chart for for this year and the next few years is to be able to handle all of that, and to, to keep them coming. Hmm. In our last minute here, I should ask Jennifer Young about one of the truly great tourism and recreation spots in the province, and that's Blue Mountain, which is not that far away from where you are right now. It's closed. What do people think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the health, the, the the hospital was feeling, and when we had our surge in the second wave, a, a huge amount of anxiety around the tens of thousands of people that come to our community on the weekends and at the holidays, and and from all around southern Ontario, the the uh, the volume of of uh, people has is always a challenge for us, but we we manage it and we thrive on it. Um, but if it's also bringing COVID in, and uh, it is it, a, a huge risk for us, so we were quite nervous. Closing the downhill skiing, a very big part of downhill skiing is the social part. And as we've seen, people are getting sick when they interact socially without masks. And um, and so A, volume of people, and B, in some ways, the nature of, of, uh, of the downhill skiing um, scene is... Uh, is um, makes it hard to do it safely. I know that exercising outside is, is really important and we can do that outside of our own doors. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry for our community that we don't have that source of income in, and, uh, uh, but it's, I do feel that it is at the present time the right thing to do given our restricted resources in, in our hospital. I'm not sure we could manage a huge, a huge surge. Understood. I want to thank the four of you for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight and giving us a sense of what's going on in your part of the province. Al McNevin from Manitoulin Island, Marg Isbester from Greater Napanee, Catherine Redden from Trent Hills, Dr. Jennifer Young in Collingwood. Be safe, everybody, and thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 26th, 2021. Tomorrow, the Citizen Lab's Ron Debert joins us on why he says it's time for civil society to reclaim the Internet. Also, we'll check in with some small business people on how they're coping in light of months of restrictions and lockdown. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.